question is, um, well, my question is um, simple. Um, I want to ask, and any of the panelists can actually uh, take the question, how can small businesses you know, to small businesses in Africa, you know, so that as a small business in maybe Nairobi or in Nigeria can actually have businesses to uh, capital to scale through blockchain products like STOs or any other blockchain uh, uh, product or smart contract to scale his business. That is just the question I, I wanted to ask. Thank you very much. Um, and I mean, he has said anyone can feel free to answer this question. So, who wants to okay. volunteer to, let me, to go let to me, the Dragos please. Den? Who wants to go to the Dragos Den? Let me let me let me respond to the question. Uh, okay. I think that was that was a very smart question, uh, and I think the, the first uh, point of call, which I've always said, is entry points, barrier points. Because how do you create access when first you don't have data? How do you create access right when there is no awareness? How do you create access when there is no channel to access those forms? So I'll break them down. First, there has to be a deliberate effort. First, for us to have an interoperability of, you know, um, of, of connections of some sort within the financial ecosystem. I'll give you an example. Um, you have our telcos operating mono products. I call them mono products because they cannot speak to each other. Why do we unnecessarily create barrier of entry even amongst us, the operators? Because if all of the telcos come together and they have a unified platform, it means if I'm on a particular telco today, I can access any other product across the other telcos and we can have that, a, a, a sort of um, cluster platform where we can share data from. Now, once data can be shared, it's easier for the behavioral credit scoring process to take place. Because when you are talking about access to credit, you also want to give credit to those who are credible. You also want to give um, access to credit to SMEs. Now, those in the SMEs are largely in the informal sectors, right? They most likely don't even have you know, financial literacy. So how can we simplify this product to explain to them first what these products are using a very conducive and seamless platform. Now, my colleague talked about USSD earlier. USSD is overly rated, right? Cards are over. Cards are going to extinct in Nigeria in the next five, six years. Trust me, because largely transactions are basically done on mobile today. Almost everybody have a mobile phone. Now, with the penetration of more mobile devices into the rural areas and urban centers, right, with a lot of awareness, it, it can create an enabling platform where everybody can, you know, have visibility to financial access, which was what I said in my opening when I talked about embedded finance. You don't not talk about cash in, cash out, right? How are you putting products that make sense to the people? So first, you can go into cluster groups. You have market women who are in the, you know, economy activities of the country, you have people in the transport sector. You have people in the agri sector. I mean, I can go on and on. Then with all of these, you now have green energy coming in. You put it there. You have credit coming in. You put it there. You have micro insurance coming in. You put it there. So all of those products are sitting on a visible platform that is accessible to everyone within the value chain. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I'm sure. I'm sure you 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 got the feedback uh, you expect. Yeah. So, if we have any further thoughts, uh, we can still give the feedback to Mr. Simeon. Uh, but in the interim, uh, okay. are there other questions? Yola. Yes. Let me also build on what um, Isa has said. So. Okay. Um, we all think that when VCs give us money, uh, we think it's free money or they don't know what to do. I, I suggest that we need to be accountable. Uh, in Nigeria, 
Amcon, that is an asset management company of Nigeria, has well over three trillion naira in toxic assets. Um, I did banking for 10 years, resigned in 2013, and I've lived to witness at least four consolidations from 105 banks to 89 banks, and then to 25 banks. And then currently, there's another round of consolidation uh, that is going on. So we need to be accountable and not think that government money is free money. Um, so when we have those clusters, like Isa has said, and we are extended loans to, we need to be accountable such that those loans are repaid back and they don't become non-performing loans, which will end up in creating uh, um, bad debt. And then lead to collapse of more banks. So I think we need to be accountable. Uh, As close as well. Go ahead. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you, Abel. That's sorry. Um, I think Dr. Mohammed. Okay, to Dr. Comment Mohammed. Oh, you have some comments. I didn't know. Please go ahead. So, Middle East and Africa can position themselves as global leaders in blockchain and fintech innovation uh, by addressing regulatory changes and impressing digital transformation, uh, fostering a supportive environment for startups leading to uh, uh, transform economies, improve lives, and drive sustainable growth by advancing blockchain fintech and fintech. These regions uh, it can unlock new opportunities, foster uh, financial inclusion, and create a, a future uh, where innovation knows no bonds. These regions can unlock immense potentials and new opportunities for growth and innovation. Together, we can create a future where technology drives inclusive, inclusive growth and uh, prosperity and driving economic growth and creating jobs in the process of overcoming existing challenges. But to answer the question, as we move forward, it's essential that we work together, governments, businesses, and entrepreneurs to create a, 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 an environment where innovation can thrive and where the benefits of these technologies can be shared by all. So at the end, let us uh, size this moment to build more connected, transparent, and inclusive world, especially for Africa and Middle East. Thank you. Right, please go ahead, Troy. Thank you, doctor. Uh, very mm. great. Uh, very great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Abiel. I just want to summarize. Um, so to the question that Gamaliel raised early on about how we can take this entire process forward, let me just offer some, some very brief thoughts on this. I think the element of the network layer, I think by and large, has been predominantly clearly defined, particularly with the internet and the TCP IP protocol. I don't think there's one country in the world doesn't connect to the internet as long as the governments allow them to connect. But I think the network layer, I think, is, is pretty well defined. Secondly, the layer above that, which is the blockchain layer, that is an area that still requires an element of harmonization. And even though I think the principles and even the cryptographic protocols are clearly defined, there still needs to be consensus uh, amongst jurisdictions across the globe in terms of what is going to be the form of blockchain that is going to be employed. So you have your standard blockchain, which the Bitcoin, for example, was developed on, and then you have the Ethereum blockchain with smart contracts. I would advocate to Dr. Mohammed's comment that I think we should consider as an African um, sort of entity to consider utilizing something based on the Ethereum blockchain that all jurisdictions on the African continent can interface with. Remember, blockchain is merely a ledger, a very secure ledger with very strong cryptographic principles. And if we agree on a standard across the African continent, I think we can then decide our best to take it forward from there. 
The third comment that I do want to make is putting the back-end infrastructure and the platforms in place is one thing, but Khalil made a very interesting comment on about how do we then get access to the end consumer. Now, in South Africa, for example, each of the telcos that are licensed by the regulator, uh, either for building fiber networks or getting access to spectrum, has to take on an annual basis part of their profits and revenues generated and put it into what is called the Universal Service Fund, a USF. I think it applies to most countries across the African continent, but the, the argument that I'm putting forward is that we could potentially lobby governments um, and authorities to effectively access those funds to digitize our economies, to take advantage of blockchain, to take advantage of fintech, to take advantage of things like CBDCs. And that effectively is a source of public funds that potentially may be available to effectively drive these initiatives that we are discussing on, on this particular call. Uh, for the record, I have attempted on least on two occasions, I've hit to break all for various reasons, which I'm not gonna get into right now. But in terms of the access to public funding, um, I would recommend and suggest that you perhaps consult um, your universal service agency or the equivalent thereof. This effectively is an agency that receives these funds from the telcos in your market and potentially could be utilized as a vehicle from a funding point of view to drive some of these initiatives we're currently talking about right now. So let me pause right now. Those are just the closing comments I'm going to make, but thank you for the opportunity once again. Thank you, Abiola. Thank you. So uh, I'll go to Chigo Zirim to have his closing thoughts. And uh, on that note, I'll invite Vibor to close the program for us. Uh, it's been a great time, really. So Chigo Zirim, uh, Chigo Zirim, please go ahead. Yes, sir. So my, my argument still borders on private and public partnership. The, the government has to come in to give us the, the atmosphere, the regulatory atmosphere, wherein people would, businesses would strive, not only securing the trust of the users, but also bringing investments. We are trying to push for a digital economy, but if the regulatory atmosphere isn't convenient for people to thrive or businesses to try to raise or build traction, it's not going to bring in the, the revenue that the, the, the governments are trying to project. Yeah, we might have vision 2020, vision 2030, vision 2040, yeah, but what are the things, what are the mechanisms? Are we on track? What are we doing to make it right? And also for companies, there's also a need for companies on the blockchain to conduct smart contract audits, code reviews, have internally established policies, likes of AML policy, KYC partnership with third party service providers when they try to integrate the API into your system to avoid any or any unforeseen circumstances. Even if there's anything that happens, maybe someone is trying to conduct some fraudulent activities, there's always going to be a trigger system, bringing an alarm, drawing the attention of the third party and then bring it to the attention of the company. And before you know it, everything will be solved. So I believe that trust is most important and very important for us to strive in this digital economy and to bring in what we actually dream of achieving. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to thank all the panelists uh, because this is more like my own closing statement before Vibori comes in uh, to finally close it. Uh, it's been a great time uh, uh, learning and sharing thoughts with everyone here. Uh, it's a privilege. It's an opportunity for us to see insights. I'm sure the members of uh, the audience have also learned one or two things that improve their ways of doing business. Uh, Vibori uh, from World Law Alliance, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to all of us to also be here. Uh, Apologies, Dr. Aviola. I, yes. I, I, I think I had a network, but I'm back. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, we're just about closing. So, uh, uh, Dr. Mohamed, you want to say a few things again? Yes, I'm very sorry again, but um, I have only two more comments. I want this uh, event to be repeated for monthly basis with a representative from all African countries and Middle East, maybe, that we will make a community like, that we can face like 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 a, a, a proposal at the end of a year, each year, and give it, for the example, to the African Union. This is one. Second thing, I wish my, my dream 
is to find a cryptocurrency for all African unions together, uh, 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 powered and supported by the African Union. Thank you very much. I'm really happy and glad to meet you all. Thank you, Issa. You can also do just a half second, and then uh, Gamali, just half second as well, and then uh, Bibori will close for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think it has been a very fantastic conversation here. Uh, for me, the take home is that we need to, just like um, Doc, Doc just mentioned, we need to come up with a position paper and engage multiple stakeholders, most especially those who are in this uh, you know, value chain. Because trust me, the economic of Africa and Middle East will only grow if we can digitize our trade. And according to World Trade you know, um, Organization and World Economic Forum, Africa only contributes to 1% of the world trade, right? And that is very, very poor. So uh, the ability for us to have a synchronized you know, currency that we can use to trade across the border. Today, for those of us who are in the industry, I can tell you categorically that we are having challenges for cross-border payment. So two things need to happen. Yes, whether blockchain, whether any other platform, we need to have that unified platform where we can, you know, access digital finance and make trade seamless. Secondly, we also need to be a bit friendly. Regulators need to be a bit friendly with the operators. And regulators also need to come closer to the operators so that we are not stifling innovation, right? And you are not, uh, the regulators are not playing the catch-up game because you can only regulate what you understand. So, and like Doc has said, let us continue to have this engagement, the conversation, and those of us who have this experience, we need to always, you know, learn to give back to the same society and the industry that have produced us. And that is exactly where experience is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, it looks like we have led a campaign here today. Uh, Gamalia, please, your thoughts, and then we'll close this with Vibori. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Troy, Isa, Samuel. Um, yeah, so I think the way forward is that Africa needs to step up its game. Um, Africa can do more. And I also do think that as private sector players, we can take the bull by the horn and ensure that the government is accountable, ensure that the government plays its role. Um, a thousand private sector players cannot replace the government. The government is big. So we need to constantly do this um, and then get into that space. Uh, possibly the next meeting we're having, let's have a government official come in and begin to throw more light on. I think he's having a network problem. Uh, so on that note, uh, Vibori, you can come in and oh, close this. Okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry for Gamaliel. I think it's going to start, but I will just take away from it. And um, yeah, okay. I begin to hear you right now. You can just end it. Uh, went back again. So anyway, I wanted to make a reply to Dr. Mohammed Turab. Actually, your ideas was presented very well. And I hope if you are able, you are soon able to establish that uh, dream. And I hope India will be there to support you as a nation for that African Union dream. And you, usually, normally, we would have had um, this conference followed by a members meeting. But today, for this event, we're not having it. So we will make sure that it is happening most more regularly, maybe quarterly. And we'll try to have, through your help, we'll try to have um, colleagues of your all your, uh, African nation to, as we draw this, incredible session to a close first thing wow i want to express our gratitude to the profound insights valuable knowledge and excitement we have shared today it has been truly inspiring to engage with such intellectual minds as a token of appreciation we are pleased to offer all esteemed speakers as well as viewers who join us today a 20 percent discount on registration tickets for unbounded 2025 in singapore and barcelona 
We hope to see you at these landmark events where we will continue to explore to shape the future together. Thank you once again for your participation and engagement. We look forward to continuing this journey with you. I would just add one small comment. If somebody needs anything from Germany, China, uh, South Africa, um, uh, Egypt, I'm always there in these four countries. So I'm uh, all around and um, anything I can help, I wouldn't hesitate to help anybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Demar. Oh, Thank okay. you. All right. Bye, everyone. It's been a great time. Bye, everyone. It was a fun. Have a good day. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the time, Troy. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Chikizirim. And thank you, Abiola.